Great. Uh, I see a couple more people have joined. Uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Um, today we're going to be talking briefly about just the end of the phase out and what's going to be happening in a couple weeks. We are probably uh, going to have quite a bit of time for questions. Um, so if you've had questions in the past, it, whether it's regarding the phase out or other tenant landlord questions, um, we're happy to try and tackle as many as we can. Um, we'll probably have uh, a pretty good amount of time at the end of this to, to touch on quite a few subjects, um, depending on what folks are asking about. So if you've had a burning question that you've wanted answered, or at least uh, discussed um, on one of these webinars, uh, feel free to drop it in the Q&A and we will do our best to, to answer it. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us today. We are going to be discussing the end of the phase out, what that means kind of going forward, um, and some of the basics of um, what evictions are going to look like come June uh, here in Minnesota. Uh, my name is Rachel Sterling. I am the COVID-19 eviction response coordinator and a housing attorney here at Homeline. Uh, I am stepping in for Eric as the host today. I've done that a couple of times, but uh, in case it's been a bit, um, you know, Eric is uh, off doing other things at the moment. So I am here as uh, our humble host. And so I will also be joined by Mike Vera, who's been on one of these several times in the past. He is the managing attorney and the hotline director here at Homeline. Uh, so he will be, uh, he is like the, the subject matter expert on a lot of the uh, tenant landlord law out there. And he'll be diving into some of the eviction basics. Um, so it's kind of a refresher for a lot of us because it's, it's been a bit. Um, so, but without further ado, let's get started here. Again, if you have questions, I'm anticipating that we'll have quite a bit of time at the end of this um, presentation part of it, at least for our prepared slides. Um, so what, regardless of whether it's about the phase out or not, if you've got questions that are related to uh, landlord tenant law, happy to you know, try and address the questions and answer them as best we're able to. So feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A function. Um, if you drop them in the chat, it is likely that I'm going to miss them. Um, so because there will be a lot of stuff flying in and out of the chat. So uh, Q&A option is a much better place to put questions if you do have any. All right, so let's move forward. So what is Homeline? Uh, for those who may be new here or um, haven't seen us before. We are a nonprofit organization that provides free legal and educational advocacy services for Minnesota tenants. Uh, we've been doing this for well, a little over 30 years now, and we've uh, helped approximately 280,000 tenants over those 30 years. Um, we are offer free and confidential legal hotline, um, as well as um, uh, sorry, language specific advice. Um, so that is part of what we do with the hotline. Um, and we've got some, actually some new staff as well. We're kind of um, expanding a little bit here. So this number of 26 may be a little off at this point. Um, this is our number. Um, these are the languages that we offer. Um, so Spanish, Somali, Hmong, and English. Um, those are the specific hotlines for those. And we do also have an email and attorney option if those are something that you are interested in and would prefer email communication. Um, we do have some eviction moratorium phase out resources um, on our website. So our website has a lot of information on it. So if you've got uh, questions or need some guidance there, we, are, we do have a bunch of stuff on the website if you go to homelinemn.org. This is our upcoming webinar schedule. We are very busy the next three weeks, actually. Uh, we took a little bit of a hiatus between March uh, to today, but uh, we are busy the next three weeks. So today we have this kind of end of the phase out overview. And then next week we are going to be offering a free CLE. So if you're an attorney and you're looking for some CLE credits, uh, we have been approved for four CLE credits, just standard credits uh, for next week. So we have a webinar coming up. Uh, it's going to be over Zoom and it's just the basics of tenant landlord law here in Minnesota. So again, free standard CLE credits, hard to pass up. And then 
Um, finally, on the 1st of June, uh, so the week after the CLE, we'll be having a um, speaker from the Department of Safety and Inspections at Saint, uh, in St. Paul. Uh, she will be coming in to discuss the rent stabilization uh, ordinance, and that will be one month from uh, when it became effective on June 1st, so we'll have um, a little bit of better understanding about how it's being um, enforced and what the rules are and how it's impacting people. So that should be a really interesting webinar. So feel free to um, sign up there. I'll drop the uh, registration link here in the chat in just a second as soon as I'm done talking. So, um, but yeah, that should be uh, really interesting next couple of weeks. So feel free to join us. All of those are free and uh, roughly the same time. The webinar, or excuse me, the CLE is four hours long. Uh, so a little bit longer than what today is goes to be, but um, yeah, feel free to join us. So finally, um, so this is gonna be my part of this presentation. Uh, this is something that I've been doing for the last several months now. And um, each time it gets shorter and shorter as we get closer and closer to kind of the end of the phase out. The, um, so the phase out was, just to recap, um, a phasing out of the eviction moratorium that the governor had put in place back in March of 2020. Um, and so that eviction moratorium was replaced with this phase out back in June of 2021 and has been uh, slowly phasing out the restrictions that the moratorium put in place. And so finally, the very last restriction that was or that still is in place, excuse me, is this uh, renter protection for those tenants who still have a pending application with a uh, particular COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program. Um, those protections last through May 31st. They expire on June 1st, according to the phase out law. And so what it says is that a uh, tenant who has a pending application with one of those qualifying programs cannot be evicted for non-payment of rent while that application is pending. Um, a tenant is supposed to um, give their landlord and the court uh, the proof of pending application um, as they have access to it. And um, the tenant, this is just something that we want to make sure that everyone knows, regardless of the fact that, you know, if they have a pending application with a qualified program, if their landlord doesn't know about it, um, then they may still file an eviction. And the court isn't going to know about that pending application um, unless the tenant actually shows up to the initial hearing and tells them. So it's really important that even though a tenant may think they have this protection, um, between now and June 1st, they need to show up to the court to show, to tell them they have it. Otherwise, um, a default judgment is likely to be filed against them, uh, which would still result in a writ of recovery being given to the landlord, which means that they can take that to the sheriff and have the eviction action proceed. Um, so best to just go to the hearing um, if there is one scheduled so that you can explain that there is a pending, that you're protected from a non-payment of rent eviction. Um, there has, uh, this is one of the slides that has uh, kind of condensed down over the months uh, as we've been going along. So I did say in the last slide, I uh, mentioned a qualifying COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program. The phase out law specifically states that there has to be uh, the funding that is, that the tenant has applied for has to be through one of the federal uh, pools of money that was were, was given to certain um, government entities. So in Minnesota, um, Hennepin County, Ramsey County, Washington County, I believe Dakota County, um, and then Minneapolis and St. Paul all got um, allocated funds from these federal pools, um, as well as the state as a whole. And so the state uh, started in on what was called the Rent Help MN program. Um, and that was to service statewide residents. And then the various counties and cities also had their own programs that may or may not have also been handled in partnership with the Rent Help MN, or uh, there was also the Zero Balance Project. Um, so that said, 
all of these programs have stopped taking applications at this time. So if you are currently a tenant who does not um, have a, um, so if you don't, if you haven't applied for one of these, unfortunately, there isn't an option to apply at this point. Um, but if you have a pending, if you have applied with the one of these programs and the application is still pending, um, then you still have that protection for the next few weeks uh, from being evicted for non-payment of rent. Um, and if you have applied um, and you haven't heard anything back for a while, it's best to kind of check in with the program that you applied through. Um, the easiest way to start that is if you applied through and help amend is to call 211 to kind of check in on your status. Um, otherwise, if you have been denied, um, they are spoke, you know, you should get a notification about that. Now, I have spoken with some tenants who did get a notification, but it went to like their junk folder uh, in their email. And so possibly a good place to start there. And um, probably if you've got questions about that process, we can talk a little bit about the appeals process um, with Rent Help MN. We are not Rent Help MN experts is not, we don't actually have much to do with the program itself, but we do have help tenants and we have been helping tenants who have been you know applicants to the program and so we've kind of we've learned to navigate the system a bit just that way so we do have um, quite a few answers about what process things you know a tenant can take um, but something also to point out that if you still have an application that's pending with one of those qualifying programs even on June 1st um, then unfortunately that protection is there anymore. So the protection that was placed uh, by the legislature last year is set to expire uh, as of June 1st. So um, that is important thing to know. So even if you have a pending application, which you very well may, if you um, are still going through any of these processes, then that protection goes away. We're not certain what's going to happen with the courts are going to do with that. Um, if they'll let the eviction actions proceed or not, we, we honestly have absolutely no idea. Um, we're going to have to wait, unfortunately, wait and see what happens, which isn't the best feeling, but it's kind of where we're at at this point. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A um, couple of other things to note um, as part of the um, COVID-19 just in general, one of the things that has come about is that there are several um, pre-eviction notice requirements that have developed over the last two years. Um, I'll start with the, the federal ones. There's actually two that are in place still. Um, there's the CARES Act one that we've talked about a lot. And essentially the CARES Act itself expired back in 2020, um, but there was one provision that never sunsetted and that was that um, covered properties, so properties covered under the CARES Act, were are still required to give a 30 day notice to tenants uh, if they are going to be evicted for non-payment of rent. Um, if you are a CARES Act covered property, uh, is a little bit more complicated to figure out. There are a lot of websites um, that will help you figure that out. Um, again, I can drop that link into the chat as soon as I am done talking, which will be shortly, I promise. Um, the other federal one is uh, HUD properties. So this is a little bit narrower than the CARES Act because it's specifically public housing and, and HUD properties in, in particular. Um, and it's a very similar notice requirement that if it's going to be for an eviction for non-payment of rent, the landlord has to give a 30-day notice. Um, and it only applies during um, state of emergencies like COVID-19. I did go and check and the um, Department of Health did re-up the state of emergency. So that is back in April. So that's good for 90 days from when that was declared. So that should be good for, uh, I think through at least June. Um, and then the other thing, difference between HUD and CARES Act is that a HUD property notice also has to list any sort of financial aid that might be available to a tenant to try and get um, assistance within, you know, that 30-day notice period. Um, additionally to the federal uh, notice requirements, there are also notice requirements uh, that have been 
issued at the local level. So St. Louis Park, uh, Minneapolis, and Brooklyn Center all have notice requirements uh, for non-payment of rent evictions. Um, Brooklyn Center also requires it for material breach evictions. So St. Louis Park requires a seven day notice, Minneapolis requires a 14 day notice, and Brooklyn Center requires a 30 day notice for non-payment and for material breach evictions. Um, we did have um, someone from Brooklyn Center in a couple of weeks ago uh, discussing that notice requirement, and we had uh, referee Sedios from Hennepin County uh, kind of going over those pre-eviction notices as well in one of our previous webinars. So if, uh, you can find both of those recordings on our website. Um, so to give a little context as well, just to kind of show like what's happening with evictions right now. One of the things that Homeline has been doing is keeping track of the evictions. Um, and as you can see, things are just going up and up. This is the rate of evictions um, for sp split out by reason. And so uh, that yellow line that's at the very top and wildly separate from everything else, that is for non-payment of rent. So those are evictions for non-payment of rent. As you can see, those are um, very uh, steep curves line up words, everything else is kind of remaining relatively steady, I guess. Um, the um, So the next two are breach of lease and holding over. And holding over is when a uh, tenancy has ended, but the tenant remains past the um, end date of the tenancy. Um, to give a little bit of more perspective about just how this looks overall, um, this is the number of evictions that have been filed since uh, October of last year per month. Um, so as you can see, April has been the, was the highest um, so far and at 1,884 evictions, which is even higher than March and February and so on and so forth. So at this rate, um, this is higher than average than what was being filed back in 2019 before um, any eviction uh, moratoriums or any restrictions were put in place. And so um, this is a much, much higher rate of eviction filings than what we've seen in the past thus far. And so that is the end of my portion of it. Um, it's, and on such a downer, but that is what it is, unfortunately. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mike, who is going to be talking about kind of eviction basics, essentially what evictions as a whole are going to look like um, uh, come June 1st, which is basically back to 2019. Not much has changed in the law since then. Um, and so I will drop all of those links that I promised I would drop into the chat. Um, so prepare for that flurry. And again, if you've got questions, um, we're anticipating this is probably not gonna take much more than half an hour to go through the next set of slides. So we've allotted 90 minutes for today. And so if you've got questions, um, now, now is the time to ask, uh, drop them in the Q&A box and we will do our best to, to discuss them. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, and Rachel's right. Yes, we are looking for your questions today. We have a couple that were submitted in advance, but once I'm done with my portion, 20 to 30 minutes uh, talking about the eviction basics, we're going to be answering whatever you want to talk about. So if that means you don't want to talk about anything, we'll be done and that's okay. But if you do have questions, submit them through the Q&A and uh, can virtually guarantee you're going to go straight to the front of the line once I'm done with my, my portion. Rachel, if you could go ahead and advance the slide, two slides. Please. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about evictions, and we're talking about evictions both past and I guess future at this point, to some extent present as well. But we're trying to think about what the eviction world looks like uh, once the pandemic protections are all gone. Every one of them, there's nothing left. Uh, and uh, we can do that pretty easily because we can look back to the time before the pandemic protections were in place. We do have some new things that Rachel did just talk about, the uh, notice requirements in St. Louis Park, Brooklyn Center, and Minneapolis. Other than that, the world of evictions isn't going to look that different from how it looked in 2019 than it will later this year. Uh, all the pandemic protections will be gone. And so I'm going to give sort of a broad overview of how the eviction process works in Minnesota. Uh, and 
If you have questions about that, that's fine. If you have questions about some other portion of landlord tenant law, that's okay as well. So to start, I always like to, to talk about the purpose of an eviction. This is something that we routinely have to explain to clients on our uh, free tenant hotline or the email and attorney service that we have that's also free, uh, that an eviction isn't truly about money. A landlord that wins an eviction and landlords are the ones that file evictions. So if a landlord wins an eviction, they don't win money. They might want money uh, because most evictions are for non-payment of rent, uh, but the tenant doesn't really win by paying. The landlord doesn't really win by getting the money. A true win for a landlord in an eviction case is where they regain possession. That's really all the court has the power to do in an eviction setting, is to figure out who has the right to possess the place. The thing that I've always used as a visual example is at the beginning of an eviction hearing, if we're thinking to the before times when the court hearings were actually in person, and most of them are still not in person right now. Uh, if we think back to those times, uh, it would make sense visually, physically, for the landlord and the tenant to walk to the front of the courtroom at the beginning of an eviction hearing and set all their keys to the rental unit in front of the judge. And then the judge decides who gets the keys at the end of that case. Now, there are times when the judge would say, I'm going to give a key back to the tenant, but it's only going to work for seven days unless they pay up what they owe. It can get a little complicated. But the judge's real job in an eviction is to figure out who has the right to possess this rental unit. That's really it. It's a very limited court, uh, and, and for a lot of good reasons. Um, evictions happen incredibly fast in our court system, right? If I were to sue somebody in district court, so for, let's say, a $100,000 contract dispute, it might take us a year before we have a meaningful hearing in district court, maybe longer, as we still have some of the pandemic uh, logjam uh, after effects going on at the civil court level. If I were to sue somebody in small claims court, conciliation court, for where I can sue for up to $15,000, this is going to vary a lot from, from county to county, district to district, but it might take us three months, it might take us six months, it might take us nine months to have a hearing. A landlord files an eviction, we'll walk through the timeline here in a, in a few slides, but it happens really quickly. Uh, depending on how the court operates, there might be a hearing within two weeks. And if there is, uh, again, limited court power. It's one of the reasons why these court cases happen so fast. In fact, let's go ahead and roll on to the, other sl the next slide and I'll talk about why evictions are as fast as they are. So here is what we used to have. Self-help is the phrase that uh, people like to use for this. Uh, and I th there's another part of that too, Rachel. Thanks, you got it. Uh, so. What would self-help look like? Well, in the past, if a landlord wanted to evict a tenant, by past, I mean before evictions. So we're talking before the Civil War in this state, for sure, when it was a territory, and it, before this in, in many other states throughout the country. If a landlord wanted a tenant gone, they'd just go over to the, the property and say, time to go. And if the tenant refused, the landlord would come back with friends with weapons, whatever the weapons of the day were, right? Bows and arrows, guns, knives, whatever. I mean, landlords and tenants have been around for a thousand years, starting back in England, at least. Um, and that's where we inherited a lot of our, our laws from. Uh, but the concept of like having a landlord tenant attorney would have been sort of absurd 200 years ago in the United States. What would they do? It was just a contract. And if the contract wasn't fulfilled, then the landlord would simply go over and remove the tenant physically. Now, that's not legal anymore. A landlord is not allowed to physically go over and say, you didn't pay your rent, time to go, or I grab you by the ear and throw you out on the street. They can't do that. They have to go through the court process. We've decided societally that we don't want that anymore. This is every state, by the way. In every state in the country, no matter how deep blue Democrat they might be, how ruby red Republican they might be, in every state in the country, a landlord can't just go throw somebody out. They have to go through a process first, which is a clear intervention with the state saying, you know what, we're going to regulate this industry because it's really important. This is where people live, this is their home. So we've got to have some say in how these transitions occur and we're going to regulate it. So that's what happens. Landlords can't simply change the locks. They can't remove the doors. They can't take the doors completely off or the locks completely off. So there's no lock at all there. 
there's no real shortcuts on this. Trust me, they've all been tried. They're all still tried. We still get calls about lockouts. We still get calls about utility shutoffs, which are actually a pretty close cousin. The landlord, again, just assume for a second, the tenant didn't pay their rent. And the landlord goes and turns off the breaker uh, to the, the main power breaker to the, to the rental unit, or they turn off the gas so there's no hot water or heat in the winter. Um, those aren't legal either. They're, they're very close cousins legally, a utility shutoff and a lockout. And the penalties are quite severe against landlords. Um, we have an expression in our office about lockouts, which it's the dumbest thing that a landlord can do that landlords still sometimes do. Uh, th don't get me wrong, there's an intuitive sense to this. If a tenant hasn't paid their rent, the landlord is thinking, well, wait, they're, they're only supposed to get possession if they pay their rent. They're not paying their rent, so I'm gonna take away possession. I understand it, I get the mentality. It's just not legal anymore. Uh, it hasn't been legal for a long time. First of all, it's a misdemeanor for the landlord to do this. Secondly, there is a civil penalty, which is pretty severe. It's $500 or three times whatever the tenant's costs are because of the lockout. So if the landlord locks a tenant out Friday night and the tenant can't get a hearing until Monday morning, the tenant stays in a hotel for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They have to buy the kids dinner, lunch, and breakfast at restaurants because they can't cook. Maybe they have to buy some new underwear, socks, things like that for the kids three times those expenses uh, or $500, whatever's greater, plus reasonable attorney's fees, a really big hammer in landlord tenant world, financially speaking, at least. So landlords generally don't do this, but like I say, we still get somewhere between 600 and a thousand calls a year, even in non-pandemic years, uh, where landlords are threatening lockouts or they've actually changed locks on a tenant. So it does happen. It's just uh, not common. And I, I wish it was phasing out more, but we still get these calls. Uh, so instead, what a landlord has for an option to try to remove a tenant is to go file the eviction, the court case. All right, let's go to the next slide. Thanks. When a landlord files an eviction for any reason, number one, they have to pay a filing fee unless the landlord's income is low enough that they qualify for a fee waiver, which it does happen. It's not common, but it happens for some landlords. The landlord has to list a reason for the eviction. They have to state on the actual court complaint why they want somebody removed. Now, Almost every eviction in Minnesota, pre-pandemic, not during the pandemic, but now once again, is for non-payment of rent. This is just why landlords file evictions. I mean, there are other reasons, and we'll talk about those in a second, but well over 90% of evictions are filed for non-payment of rent. It's a transactional industry, right? The tenant either pays their rent or the landlord says, well, I'm gonna have to get somebody in here that can. Um, and so I'm going to go file an eviction. So that's what motivates most evictions to be filed in Minnesota. A couple things about payment of rent when it's due. Well, look at the lease. It's always the starting point. Not everybody has a written lease in Minnesota. Our guess, 5 to 7% of leases in Minnesota are handshake deals. In general, they're not required to be in writing. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that. But most leases are written down. So look at the lease to see when is the rent due. Most leases, certainly most metro area leases, uh, say that the rent is due on the first of the month, but there might not be a late fee until the third or the fifth, it's the most common day that late fees kick in, or maybe the seventh. Um, but that's a little bit confusing. If you think about that question, when is the rent due? Well, it's due on the first, but there's no late fee till the fifth. Well, the rent was still due on the first. So the landlord could go file an eviction on the second uh, if they wish to, except for, of course, Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, and Brooklyn Center, who now have these ordinances requiring warnings from the landlord before they can file a non-payment of rent eviction. There's also a, a cap on late fees as well. It's 8%. Um, this is, in my mind, a bright line, speed limit kind of rule. Now, what I mean by that isn't that, that everybody ignores it and drives well over the speed limit. That's not what I mean. Uh, it's an understandable rule, the 8% rule. Every landlord seems to get this one. Now, they might try to dodge the late fee rule, but most don't. I'm guessing 99% plus compliance since this rule took effect over 10 years ago. Uh, so the late fee rule seems to be followed by landlords. Uh, maybe half go to 8% and probably half stick around 50 bucks uh, as far as late fees go. The next reason a landlord might list for an eviction is something called holding over. Holding over is where the landlord has given the notice, uh, I'm sorry, the tenant a notice to vacate by the end of a lease. Let's say the lease ends June 30th. The landlord says, because the lease requires it, uh, tenant, I'm not renewing your lease at the end of June. And they told them back in April or maybe by the end of this month, by the end of May. Or maybe the tenant gave a notice to vacate saying I'm leaving. 
Um, on the first one, the landlord giving the notice, other than Brooklyn Center, which has their own new ordinance uh, where they require just cause, throughout the rest of the state, the general rule is the landlord doesn't even need a reason. If the lease is over, that's just the end of a contract. And either side can decide whether they want to have another contract or not. And so a landlord doesn't need to come up with a compelling reason why they're giving a notice to vacate. But let's say they told the tenant that they needed to leave by June 30th. Uh, if the tenant's still there on July 1, the landlord would file the eviction and they'd mark on the boxes uh, that you can check holding over. Next up, we have the bad behavior uh, law. So this is a specific law passed during the war on drugs era, um, early 90s. Uh, and it's an odd law. I, I, I was not in the landlord tenant arena at that time. I was in undergrad or law school then. So in a, a different state, states uh, at the time. So I don't really understand the formation of, let me tell you what I don't get about this law. This is a pretty limited list. It says that you can be evicted as a tenant pretty much right away, um, much faster than a normal eviction if there are illegal drugs found in your place, illegal weapons, um, by the way, the illegal drugs, everything you'd guess would be on the list is on that list. Uh, illegal weapons, there's a list of those, sawed off shotguns, automatic weapons, if you've been convicted of a felony, for example, prostitution or possession of stolen property. And, and okay, that's fine. If you wanna have that list as a law for a reason why a landlord can file an eviction, that's uh, the legislature can certainly do that, but why do they don't include kidnapping and murder and torture and rape, whatever? Right? There's a whole list of criminal laws that they could have included, but it's limited to these four. If you commit any of this in any amount, one grain of marijuana left in the ashtray from two weeks ago when your cousin was there is enough to get a tenant evicted under this statute, which has been, like I said, around since the early 90s. By the way, this is part of every lease, whether it's a handshake deal or a 50 page lease that doesn't mention it at all. This is still part of every lease in Minnesota. It's incorporated by law into the lease. And it's the only eviction that somebody else can file as well. It doesn't have to be the landlord. Who can file it? Well, the county or district attorney, depending on how it's phrased. Uh, I think it's county attorney exclusively, actually, now that I say that. Uh, county attorney can file this on behalf of the landlord. So if the landlord uh, has a tenant that it's discovered that they've got uh, a drug ring running out of their rental unit, and the landlord is understandably nervous about being the person who puts their name on the eviction uh, against this drug kingpin, they can have somebody else file the eviction on their behalf. The county attorney has the power to do so. It's the only situation I know of where somebody else can file an eviction on behalf of the landlord. Uh, last up is the other random one. This is the other breaches where landlords can file an eviction for something else in the contract. So generally it needs to be a written lease. It could be something in an oral agreement. Hey, you can live here, $500 a month, pay on the first of each month, no dogs, right? It could have been said, Although that's not necessarily enough, uh, the, the landlord probably would have needed to say no dogs. And if you have any dogs, then I can evict you right away. Uh, that's what we call a right of reentry clause, um, a very strangely worded phrase uh, that confuses everybody that sees it, but that's what it's about. Does the lease say that if you violate a term of the contract, then I, the landlord, can evict the tenant for violating that term of the contract? It needs to be in there in Minnesota which is one of the reasons why a landlord that has gotten some sort of internet uh, standard lease that's supposed to kind of work throughout the country is really doing themselves a disservice in this state if, because they probably will not have a right of reentry clause. Um, we see this regularly. I, I, I look at leases virtually every day that I work uh, on our tenant hotline um, and right of reentry clauses are, are certainly not there I don't know, 5% of the time, maybe higher than that, uh, where a landlord doesn't have that in the contract that they're using, which they provided, because that's what happens. Landlords provide the leases. The other uh, criteria that a landlord has to meet is that the breach has to be what we call material. What does that mean? Well, it's a really subjective term, but essentially it's, it's a judge deciding, do I want to make a family potentially homeless because a landlord is upset that the tenant violated one of their rules? So I mentioned earlier that I read leases every day that I work in our hotline. I'm one of the primary people that answers our email and attorney directly and people frequently send leases. So the, the number of cases where I look at leases has gone up uh, a lot in the last few years since I've started doing more of the email questions myself. Uh, leases are, are uh, there's a strange blend um, uh, when it comes to leases. Some leases, there's five or six leases that a lot of landlords like to use throughout the state sort of repeatedly. 
Uh, by the way, if you're wondering, if you're a landlord, what lease should I be using? We're big fans of the State Bar Association lease. It's free. Uh, Rachel could probably put a link up there for you on that. Um, I, it's the one I would use if I were a landlord because I think it covers everything and I think it's a really good starting out. Uh, so sort of an amateur landlord, somebody who's just getting into the game uh, might want to use that lease because it covers everything you need covered. And it certainly is Minnesota specific, which is the most important part of a lease. Anyhow, five to seven leases that are very commonly used throughout the state that we see on a fairly regular basis. But that's not all the leases we see. We see a lot of other leases. Um, actually, in, if, if you recall from the whatever, 85 of these speeches we've done since COVID started, I've talked a couple of times about my favorite type of lease, uh, the sort of thing that I find just fascinating. Uh, as I mentioned, there are these internet leases where people get them that are not Minnesota specific. Those are bad for landlords. Next up are leases that are Minnesota specific. They've been carefully thought through by an attorney or a team of attorneys. And uh, those typically are pretty good for landlords. Uh, they're covering what they need to cover. But a lot of landlords like to get creative on this. Think, oh, I can write a lease. How hard can it be? So some of them will take and look at five or six different leases. And you can see where they're sort of stealing clauses from that they like from various leases. Again, pretty dangerous from a landlord perspective. They might not have that right of reentry clause saying, if you violate a term of the lease, then I can evict you right away without warning. Um, but my, my favorite leases are the ones that are homemade. And when I say my favorite, I, I mean, I, I literally will take a pause in my day and I'll read a lease kind of for enjoyment. Um, I mean, hey, look, I, I'm in a job that I've been doing a long time and you always look for the unique stuff to keep you interested, right? So a homemade lease is a, a nice little diversion for me sometimes. And there's levels of homemade leases. Like I said, you'll see the ones that are sort of cobbled together, stealing parts of other uh, legitimate leases. But then you'll see ones that are re really just homemade where a landlord, you can tell they sat down at a computer and they just started typing what they thought the rules should be. Um, those are fascinating to read. Uh, and they're fine. Those typed ones are interesting to me. By the way, I still see some that are uh, literally, using that word right, literally typed on a typewriter. You can tell it's still a typewriter that they've been copying for uh, decades. Uh, my favorite lease, though, however, always is the handwritten lease. There's nothing like a handwritten lease. And uh, at the top of the chart of handwritten leases is a handwritten lease in cursive. Those are just... Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding. I find them fascinating to read. They tell me a lot about the person writing them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it might cover what a landlord needs covered, but if you are a landlord, look at the State Bar Association lease as an option. All right. Anyhow, those are the reasons why a landlord can file an eviction. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. I mentioned earlier the timeline. So this is one of those things that, uh, I don't know why people get so confused about this, but they really do. Uh, in the before times, I used to give a lot of speeches in front of landlords. I still do, but they're on Zoom now. But it's not the same as when you're in a room asking people questions. One of the things that I would ask landlords when I would start talking about evictions is, how long does an eviction take? How long do you think that evictions take? And the answers I'd get would be just uh, surreal. It takes a year it would be a common answer. It takes a year to evict somebody. Six months. Six months to a year. Somewhere in there to evict somebody. Um, okay. So... No, that's not the right answer at all. How does it take a landlord six months to a year to evict somebody? Can it happen? Yes. The tenant could appeal the case all the way up to the Minnesota Supreme Court, I suppose, and that might take well over a year. They could appeal it all the way to the Court of Appeals, Minnesota Court of Appeals. Eh, it's going to take eight, nine, 10 months. Okay, fair enough. But those cases are very rare, very rare. Again, almost every case in Minnesota, almost every eviction in Minnesota, is filed for non-payment of rent. And then really it's a question, does the tenant have the money? Is there a way that they can settle up fairly quickly with some sort of payment plan or not? And if they don't, if the tenant doesn't really have any plans or uh, realistic hopes for getting the money to the landlord and the landlord's gone through the checklist of basic things to get the eviction right, it's a 20 to 30 day process. And, and this is, I'm sure 98 plus percent of all evictions in Minnesota are done where the, ten the tenant is actually physically gone within this 20 to 30 days. The last phase, by the way, of the eviction process is the sheriff will come by twice. The first time on the screen that you see right now, it says July 26th would be the sheriff's visit in our example where the landlord went and filed an eviction for non-payment on July 2nd. 
But this first sheriff's visit, the sheriff puts a note on the door saying, tenant, you have 24 hours to go. After the 24 hours, uh, if the tenant's still there, the landlord calls, calls the sheriff back and says, we need to schedule a move out. And sometimes the sheriff will come by that same day and get the tenant out so they can plan a, a move out where a moving truck might come and they have to inventory the pro uh, property as well. Uh, that's how quickly evictions happen. Again, this is really all an eviction court can decide. Who gets possession? I've talked about money endlessly throughout today's session and for the last three years when we've been doing these or two and a half years when we've been doing these. Um, but if a tenant wins an eviction, that means they get to stay probably by paying. If a landlord wins an eviction, what that means is uh, that they probably get the keys to the place, not money. If the tenant has to go because of the eviction, the landlord can sue the tenant in a different court for money, or they could turn it over to a collection agency, whichever way they'd like to go, but they don't get a cash payment for winning the eviction case. They get the keys. That's what this is really about. And that's why this time frame is so short. There's such a, a limit to what that judge or referee has the power to do in an eviction hearing. Okay, let's go on to a couple defenses. And then I think I'll still be keeping that time pace that I thought we would be in. We can start getting to questions, my favorite part of anything like this. All right, so these are general eviction defenses that I wanna talk about. The first one is service of process. So one of the things that I'm asked frequently if I'm talking to a group of landlords, um, and again, our office gets invited to all kinds of speeches. Uh, we talk to social workers, we talk to schools, colleges, high schools, uh, landlord groups, city inspectors, police officers, and that's just uh, groups that I can think of in the last year that we've spoken to. Um, service of process is one of those things that landlords will ask me about. How do I do that? And do I need to, hmm, do I need to uh, hire a lawyer to file an eviction for non-payment of rent is a common question that I get. And it might vary where we're at in the state uh, as far as whether it makes sense, but certainly in the, in the, unless the landlord has a, a corporation that they formed, an LLC or a higher level of a corporation, uh, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense for a landlord to hire a lawyer to file a non-payment of rent eviction is my short answer to that. However, serving the court papers, the landlord I really recommend strongly hires that out. Uh, anybody in the, in the world can serve those papers as long as it's an adult that's not the owner themselves. But the owner could stand there and have their friend, you know, the, the, the landlord could point at the tenant and say to their friend, that's the tenant, go give them the papers. That would be okay. But what if the tenant's not around? It gets a little bit complicated. So who should the landlord hire when it comes to this? I think the sheriff in most cities uh, does this for a reasonable fee. There's also private process servers. $75 to $100 seems to be something like the going rate for this sort of thing. Uh, and it, if you get this wrong as the landlord, your case is simply dismissed. You, you probably have to start over. You probably have to file again another $300 filing fee, uh, which landlords are obviously reluctant to be throwing around meaninglessly. The next general defense, uh, and there's a host of these sort of, if you want to call them technical defenses, you can. Again, courts are pretty regulated places, and you either follow their rules or you don't get to get the benefits that they might offer. Um, here's another one of them, uh, which is the landlord needs to have disclosed who they are to the tenant, along with an address of some type. Uh, the theory is that if the tenant ever needed to sue the landlord for some reason, a slip and fall, or maybe a rent escrow, uh, anything like that, then they'd need an actual physical address to be able to sue the landlord. So how the legislature has kind of required this is they say that, Landlord, you can't file an eviction unless you've disclosed who you are with an address uh, somewhere where the tenant would be able to serve you papers if they needed to, um, if they filed a court case. So if a landlord owns a duplex and they live on one half and the tenant lives in the other half, then it's not going to be a problem. The tenant clearly knows where the landlord is, but that's not most landlord-tenant relationships. Most of the time, the tenant doesn't know uh, necessarily unless the landlord says who they are and where they are. Uh, the landlord can use an agent for service of process. And that's done fairly regularly. A lot of management companies do that sort of thing for landlords as well. Um, but anyhow, this has to be complied with or else the eviction uh, defense would be, I never got this statute met. Next up is it's cold out or I've got kids or I'm pregnant. These are defenses that tenants believe exist, but they really don't. It's kind of a myth. One of the things that we do a lot on our tenant hotline, we're 
15,000 plus a year, people call us up and ask us what their rights and responsibilities are, is we have to dispel myths. And this is one of those myths. I can't be evicted during the winter, right? You sure can. If you don't believe us, then you can go watch court in January in Minneapolis, because that's where they have the, the biggest eviction uh, system in place. And it doesn't stop in January or February because it's cold out. It just doesn't. It did stop briefly for the pandemic, but not for long. Um, and it's back up and nearly fully operational and will be again on June 2nd after all the eviction protections are gone that Rachel was talking about earlier. Okay, let's go on to our uh, last uh, subject slide, which is defenses to non-payment evictions. I'm not gonna talk about every defense to every eviction because most of the evictions are never filed. Like we talked about almost every eviction is for non-payment of rent, but let's talk about non-payment of rent specific defenses for a second. Number one, redemption. So redemption is a legal term. It's actually found in this statute, which is the eviction key statute. Uh, and it says that if a tenant can pay everything they owe, so this is going to be the rent, the late fee, um, the court costs, then the tenant gets to stay. Uh, if it's a non-payment or rent case, non-payment or rent eviction, exclusively a non-payment or rent eviction, there's no other allegations by the landlord. Uh, the tenant walks into court with all the money, they get to stay. And as far as their lease is concerned, it's as if the eviction never happened. Now the eviction is still on the record unless it gets removed or expunged, which could happen eventually, might be part of a settlement. But if it's a pure redemption, that means I'm sort of picturing the landlord saying, I don't want the money, I want them gone. And the judge saying, well, landlord, look, you filed an eviction just for non-payment of rent. Tenant says they got all the money right now. If they just set it in front of me here on the bench, you gotta take it, sorry. The landlord has no choice if the tenant has the money in time for court. Like I mentioned earlier, the judge can extend the time. That's the only way in which it's cold out or I'm pregnant or I've got kids defense matters or disability. The judge can give seven more days for the tenant to come up with money uh, and still redeem during that seven day pay period. Next defense is what we call a partial payment, just like what it sounds. Uh, the tenant pays some of what they owe and the landlord accepts it. Now, this law doesn't actually stop a landlord from doing that and make it that they lose an eviction, but what it wants a landlord to do is write down what the agreement was between the tenant and the landlord. Uh, and this is one of those things where advice that I give to landlords is very different from what landlord attorneys, for instance, give for advice to their clients. So because I've seen landlord attorneys talk, uh, we watch them give speeches, they watch us give speeches. And one of the things they'll say to their clients, the landlord is never accept a partial payment because that gives the tenant a partial payment defense which I think is wonderful advice if your goal as a landlord is to win evictions. If your goal as a landlord is to collect rent, a partial payment should be considered, is how I'd view this from a business perspective. And, and I use the same numbers every time because they just seem to be things that people can line up with. Let's say the rent is $1,000 and the rent is due on the first and the tenant comes to the landlord on the seventh and says, I know it's a thousand bucks and I know there's an $80 late fee. Um, and I know you could have filed an eviction against me already. But here's the thing, I got 700 bucks right now. I got 700 right now and I can get you the other 380 by the 12th, okay? If I'm a landlord, what this statute wants me to do, what 504B.291 wants me to do is to write down that agreement. All right, I'm taking 700 now and I get 380 on the 12th. If not, then on the 13th, I can go file an eviction. I sign it, the landlord, the tenant signs it, put the date on it. Everybody's knowing what's being agreed to. That's what this statute wants. And the landlord in that situation is up 700 bucks. Again, if a landlord is just in the, how do I win evictions business? They should never take a partial payment. But if they're in the, how do I collect as much money as I can? I think that's worth at least considering. Now, if the tenant comes to you on the seventh as the landlord with $50 saying, I've got 50 and I can get you the other, you know, 1,030 on the 13th, that's a much different offer. Uh, but if it's a substantial portion, a landlord should and typically does consider this because they're in the rent collection business, not in the eviction business. Another defense for a tenant is I paid it. So <laughs> there are still landlords that require cash payment for rent. They, they don't prefer it. They don't allow it. They insist on it. That's the only way that rent's going to be collected. Um, it, it happens. We deal with this on a fairly regular basis. How do you prove that you've paid the rent in a cash payment system? Well, you get a receipt from the landlord would be ideal. The landlord is by law supposed to do that, but they don't always do it. Uh, maybe the tenant as a witness, watch them hand the cash to the landlord. But I paid it is actually a defense that we run into much more regularly than you might think. And it's really just a matter of who can prove what was paid. Uh, 
general rule when it comes to proving payment, it's on whoever paid it to prove that they paid something. It's almost impossible to prove a negative. Although a landlord having a solid, um, easy to follow ledger can go a long way towards helping convince a judge or referee that they weren't in fact paid. Uh, landlords that require electronic payment, this is a lot easier. Um, or even something a little more uh, homemade, but still electronic looking where the tenant can pay the rent directly to a landlord's bank account. They're, they're called push not pull accounts where somebody's allowed to put money into the account, but can't take money out. Um, and so that is an example of a way to get paid. So everybody knows that the payment happened. Next up is what we call a Fritz defense. So a Fritz defense is a case, uh, Fritz is named after Fritz v. Warthen was a Supreme Court case in Minnesota in the 70s that said that a tenant could withhold their rent to force a landlord to make repairs. We don't really like Fritz defenses versus the alternative, which is a rent escrow. Uh, a rent escrow, the tenant is on offense. They're the plaintiff. Uh, if it's a Fritz defense, the tenant is on defense. Uh, what that, why that's bad for the tenant is, that means an evictions is on, it's on the tenant's record to start the case. We'd prefer not to risk that in most situations. So, but it can be done. If the tenant has the money to pay the rent into court, they can assert a Fritz defense uh, saying, I withheld my rent to force the landlord to make repairs. We've already talked about late fees, shouldn't exceed 8%. I didn't owe the rent. That's a bizarre claim. I didn't owe rent, uh, but it happens. Uh, not every tenant pays their rent through cash. A lot of tenants pay their rent through some form of labor. Um, the traditional stuff, kind of a caretaker, uh, you clean up around the, the building or maybe you help lease up the apartment uh, as they become empty. Um, or maybe the tenant has some special skills. They're a roofer or a mechanic and they exchange um, labor for uh, the work that they're doing. Uh, so uh, I didn't owe it. The tenant did owe something. They just paid it in something that was other than cash would be where we see that defense pop up. Okay, uh, again, uh, go ahead and you know what? Advance it two slides if you would please, Rachel. I wanted to mention one thing about the CLE that you didn't mention for uh, next week. So next Wednesday, we are doing, we're not making this up. This is a four hour speech. We have done this traditionally in the past, just for lawyers. You don't have to be a lawyer to watch though. It's free. If you want to learn what I just did for evictions, we're going to be doing for virtually every key topic that we cover uh, in landlord tenant law. So anybody that wants to watch this, we've in the past had, like I said, social workers, uh, tenants, uh, landlords have attended that and you're welcome to attend. You don't need to be a lawyer to attend, but a lawyer gets an extra benefit of having free CLE credits. Um, but we, we designed it as kind of a training manual for people to work in our office and they use it for the next year. We'll, we'll probably do another one. We used to do these every year before the pandemic hit and then we, we slowed down on that. But we're, that's why we're doing it. But anybody's welcome to watch that next week. And if you could take it back to the slide before that, uh, then I'm gonna let you talk so I can have a sip of something. All right, thanks for all of that, Mike. That was a lot. Awesome. Thank you again. Um, so yeah, so we've got a little over half an hour. And if you have any questions, um, we've got a couple that were pre-submitted that we'll go through. And then I see there is one in the Q&A right now. Um, feel free to drop any questions you've got in the Q&A box and we'll address them as we're able to. And I'm um, going to jump in. Sorry. When you do submit a question, it's great if you tell us kind of your role in the world, yeah. uh, landlord, social worker, tenant, whatever. You don't have to identify yourself if you don't want to. We try to just limit it to first names when we say it. But just knowing where the question is coming from helps us try to figure out the answer sometimes. Yep. Or uh, sometimes, you know, it's a small box. So sometimes it's just easier for us to get in the mindset of like, oh, landlords asking this question. So this is what they mean by that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So first off, we'll go to the questions that were pre-submitted. Um, and so Mike, you are on the hot seat. So I hope you got enough water because we're, we're going to, we're going to start. All right. Uh, so Pat, who is a landlord, uh, is asking, uh, who do we send a bill to for unpaid rent and damages? Yeah. So Pat's question, I'm guessing, is about uh, assuming the tenant isn't able to get current on the rent that they owe, like rent help fell through, something like that, which is a common thing that we're encountering right now. And a landlord's trying to figure out how do I get my costs recovered? So I'm going to make this question. A sort of a two-part answer. One is the immediate answer and the other one is kind of the big picture answer. So the immediate answer is, well, if a landlord thinks that a tenant owes money for rent or for damages, they're gonna bill the tenant for it. 
Um, let's say the tenant left owing $3,000. What's the landlord likely to do? Well, they could file a claim in conciliation court. Again, a landlord or anybody can sue for up to $15,000 in conciliation court, small claims court. No attorney necessary, costs about $70 to file the case. If you win the small claims court case, the $70 gets tacked on to what you win. The problem with small claims court is uh, winning doesn't mean you get cash. It just means you get a piece of paper saying that the tenant owes money. By the way, small claims court, we help tenants sue uh, very regularly when it comes to security deposits as well. So we see both defending cases in small claims court and starting cases in small claims court. Uh, but uh, a landlord trying to collect rent and any money for damages, that's where they, one of the options that a landlord would have. Another option a landlord would have is they could be, perhaps turn this over to a collection agency. So the, the nice thing about a collection agency from a landlord's perspective is it's less effort. It tends to yield less money. Uh, big picture, if the collection agency actually collects that $3,000, they're going to take some percentage of that. That's what they get paid to do is collect the money. And if they get the money, they get a percentage of that. So the landlord would be forfeiting some of that money uh, versus if the landlord went to conciliation court and won uh, and they were able to collect the money on their own, then they'd get the entire proceeds. Uh, the other benefit of collections uh, through court versus a collection agency is if a, a landlord sends a claim through a collection agency, that's really what they have. Technically, it's called a claim. Somebody owes me something, they're telling the world. And the world that cares about that is credit bureaus who get our credit scores figured out for us. So it will affect somebody's credit that there's an outstanding debt out there and it might make it really hard to get housing in the future. But that's different from if a landlord goes to small claims court and wins and gets a judgment. So a judgment is a pretty amped up claim. Um, and it allows anybody that's got a judgment to try to do much more aggressive things to collect the money versus just damaging somebody's credit. Um, so like uh, garnishing wages is one of the steps that somebody can take. You garnish somebody's wages down to the minimum wage level if they're working. And that's one way to uh, try to actually collect the money versus just being able to damage somebody's credit. It's one thing to damage somebody's credit, but some people don't care. They might file a bankruptcy, which could affect both of these anyway. But Short term, how do landlords collect money from tenants? It's through conciliation court and through collection agencies are the two most common ways that we see landlords try to collect money that a tenant owes. Big picture, I, I think what Pat's really asking here is, hey, I'm a landlord. I didn't get paid during the pandemic. Where's my money? Right? I think that's what it's really kind of asking. Uh, to start, there was literally hundreds of millions of dollars given to Minnesota uh, to disperse to landlords to try to make landlords whole as part of the pandemic recovery process, assuming that tenants were losing their jobs through no fault of their own and that they weren't able to pay. And so this was how to get landlords current. All those programs are essentially exhausted. There's no way to really apply for them now. The legislature's still in session. Uh, they could decide to do whatever they want with a massive surplus that this state has. And so, especially if you are in a, a rural area as a landlord and you wanna get paid, um, you might have a huge outsized impact by contacting your local legislators and saying, I would like to see more money for getting landlords paid, which probably also means tenants getting current on their rent um, based on you know, post pandemic uh, debts that are still due. Uh, there's every, there's a lot of money available to the legislature to make that decision if they had the political will to do so. Uh, it appears as though that's not the case right now, but like I said, we still have, I guess it's six days less left of the uh, current session that we're in. Yeah, I think they have to get stuff sorted out by Sunday. Um, I'm going to add something to that as well. It kind of piggybacks off of your thing. It's a little bit outside of our general scope, but um, there is a program that Minnesota Housing just launched called Home Help MM, and that's for homeowners specifically who um, need help because of COVID-19, paying like mortgage payments and, and things like that. It does also cover lot rent and um, a couple other things. I'm going to drop the... Um, the link here. So that's something that landlords could also look into as well if they're having struggling with those sorts of homeowner uh, 
things. Um, I believe they're open now, but they are, they do have a closing date of June 17th, but they've already said they'll be closing by that date. Um, and they are anticipating that's uh, going to be a first come first serve sort of uh, process. So I don't have a lot of information on that program, but I do know that it's out there. I dropped the link in the chat. So if that, if you're a landlord and that's sort of a situation you're in, it might be worthwhile looking into that, see if you qualify. All right, the second question we got ahead of time was from Jasmine, who I believe is a service provider. Mm. And they are asking, uh, what will Homeline do to support families that can and will be affected by this ending? This being, I assume, the phase out. Right, uh, fair question. So the short answer is we're gonna be doing what we've been doing for 30 years, which is we're gonna try to help people understand the process as best we can. Um, we, we don't have funding here. We, we've never given money to tenants to help pay rent. So that's not what we'll be doing. But we, and, and we don't fully represent people either. That's not our model, legal aid or a place like Volunteer Lawyers Network. That's the kind of thing they do if somebody's eligible for their help. But there's so many tenants that have been affected for so long, long before the pandemic, that simply need answers to their, their questions. And while we can put on presentations like this, we can produce materials, um, an actual one-on-one -on -one conversation, either through our free tenant hotline um, or by emailing an attorney directly. Both services are free lets us look at a contract if we need to, look at the actual court papers, talk through with somebody what they're experiencing to try to figure out what their options are and likely consequences for those options. Um, many times we can help a tenant navigate an eviction to the point where they don't end up losing their home. We understand how landlords want payment plans to look and we can talk through how to present that sort of prospect to a landlord if a tenant is going to court in Bemidji and they don't qualify for help from legal aid, but they wanna know how to give themselves the best shot to uh, keep their home. And we'll walk through based on our experience, hey, this is what landlords generally go for. Um, so give you an example. Let's say the tenant owes $5,000. They're $5,000 behind in rent in Bemidji. And the uh, landlord goes and files an eviction, which costs them 300, so now they're down $5,300. And the landlord's mad because they've been not getting rent consistently throughout the pandemic. They don't really trust the tenant. So there's, there's a lot of frayed nerves. The tension is high between the two parties, but the landlord still wants the money. That's what they want. They don't really want the place empty if it's $5,300 owed. They'd rather get $5,300. So the tenant has been working, let's say, for a month or two. Um, they restarted work. They finally got back into the job that they had pre-pandemic or at least a job that started to pay them like they got paid pre-pandemic. Pre um, and so uh, the tenant has some money. They owe this $5,300 and they've got, let's say $3,000 saved up. And the tenant looks at that $5,300 number and they think, well, what's the point? I don't have it all, so I'm gonna lose this eviction. What I would do in that situation is I'd talk to the tenant and I'd say, okay, let's just think this through. When do you think you could get caught up? Let's say you gave the, the landlord some of this money. Let's say 2,500 because you still need to eat. I don't want you to give every penny to the landlord. You need to get to work somehow. Um, but if you gave the landlord 2,500, how soon could you get paid off the other you know, 2,800 that you owe and keep your rent current as you go? How soon could that happen? The tenant sits down, puts pen to paper, knowing based on their job that they got started again, what's going on? You know what, I think I could get current by mid-August. Okay, well, why don't you approach the landlord with that? I have $2,500 today, it's yours. But in exchange, we have a payment plan where I'm gonna make the next five payments, you know, varying numbers. Don't promise anything you can't deliver based on the income that you know you've got coming in. And if you make all five payments, you get to stay as if this wasn't filed. You're back on your lease would be a phrase we'd use there. Now, why would the landlord say yes to that? Again, landlords like money. They wanna get paid. They're not in the eviction business. Landlords that are in the eviction business don't last. Landlords are in the rent collection business. Now I realize we've got the increased tension of months and years of landlords feeling certainly less empowered than they were pre-pandemic because they just were. A lot of their rights, a lot of their abilities as landlords were simply yanked away from them because of the pandemic. You can despise that or you can love that. It doesn't really matter. That's just what happened. Landlords lost a lot of their 
inherent powers during the pandemic. Those are almost all, and they will be all back in a couple of weeks. Uh, and so landlords might be feeling like flexing makes the most sense, but in the end, this is a business for landlords. And so what we do while we're not paying somebody's rent, while we're not representing somebody in court, is we talk to them about how can they maybe resolve this on their own. Now, let's say that landlord says no to the $2,500 offer. Um, the, uh, the, the tenant could say, well, okay, I'm gonna keep my $2,500 and I'm gonna use it for my next place. And I'll try to catch up with you landlord that I owe $5,300 to when I can, but it's not gonna be my priority. My priority is gonna be, how am I gonna pay for the roof over my head uh, starting you know, July 1 or whenever I'm gonna need to pay for that. So anyhow, longer answer than you might've been looking for Jasmine, but that's kind of where it took me uh, mentally, the question that you asked. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, so then we only really have one question that's been- in Are you kidding me? One question of 25? I can't do 25 minutes on one question. I need more questions. <laughs> I mean, we could also have uh, story time. That is also awesome. <laughs> sure. Um, or we can get let people go experience some sunshine. We sure can. If you have a question, ask it. That's fine. But uh, and we have plenty of time to do that. But let's let's do our the one that's on the books. Let's see. Yeah, we've that got one. a little over twenty minutes at this point. Okay. Um, okay. So the question is from anonymous, and they're asking what happens with a partial payment where there's no discussion about what happens. For example, the property has a drop box, and the tenant puts a partial payment in that drop box, um, then subsequently doesn't answer any forms of communication prior to the eviction hearing date. So I'm not sure who anonymous is here. I don't know if it's a landlord or a tenant. I think it's a landlord um, based on the phrasing of the question, but it's not. I'm not positive of that. But let's say it's a landlord for a second. Um, well, okay, so if the tenant puts the money in the drop box, if I'm the landlord and I don't want a partial payment defense to be possible, I'm gonna return it. I'm gonna return it to the tenant. I'm gonna say, hey, I got this in the drop box. It ain't enough. You're supposed to pay everything or else we work out a deal, uh, but I'm not gonna keep this. I'm not gonna keep this partial payment. Uh, if I'm the tenant, I, it's not a guaranteed win for the tenant. It's certainly something I'd bring up. If I were in, in the in eviction hearing, uh, I would absolutely say, judge, I did make this payment on this date. The landlord hasn't returned it. So I assume they cashed the check or kept the money order or however you want to phrase it. But it's a possible defense. How the lease is phrased matters as well. Uh, and so there's quite a few things to look at that are very specific to the actual case uh, for sure. But trying to answer that one from both perspectives. All right. Not a twenty-minute answer. No. Okay. Very, but yeah, that's fine. It was a it was a good answer. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So I, I think we should give people maybe two or three more minutes to ask a question if they wish. I don't want to chase people yep. off, uh, but if they want to go, as you said, at least where I am, I can see blue sky out my mm -hmm. garden level window. <laughs> so I can only uh, ever see a sliver of the sky. It might just be that part that's blue. It might be gray everywhere else. But but any I, other questions that people have? Now's the time. Oh, there's a question at the beginning of the chat. Thank you, Johnny. Let's see that one. Okay. See, this oh, is why I you. said way yeah. back when not to, right. to put them in the Q&A. But thank you, Johnny. I appreciate it because I do miss these. Um, how uh, you know, I, I'm going to ask this one. Though, right. I think you're the answerer for this one. All right. Uh, this one's from okay. Maggie. And she asked, how can we confirm that the application is pending and not denied? So this, I assume this is for rent help or something like that. Um, okay. So... Great question. So the um, basically one way to do that with rent help um, and with any of those programs, most of them have already paid out. You should know if you have a uh, pending application because um, you hit the submit button um, and you got some sort of confirmation to it. Um, I know that Rent Help MN prefers email communication over everything else. Um, and so if you have an email address with them, uh, they're probably going to be emailing you a denial um, if you got denied. And so then that's something that is either going to show up in your regular inbox or it may show up in your spam. Um, and so it's worthwhile looking through your spam stuff for any rent help MN communications. Um, Rachel, the, what if Maggie is a landlord and she wants to confirm that the application is pending and not denied? How can the landlord so do that? That would be, you would want to go to your um, 
if you're a landlord and you should have some sort of dashboard and I don't know what this dashboard looks like I haven't actually seen it myself because again we don't work with rent help specifically we don't have access to their systems um, but my understanding is that on your dashboard it should show where you know which of your tenants has applied once you get connected up and then the status of their application at that point and any questions that rent help may have for you specifically as a landlord for that application um, alternatively uh, you can call uh, land, as a landlord you can also call 211 to get a status update whether you're a landlord or a tenant actually um, and landlords also have an email. Uh, it's landlords at renthelpmn.org. Um, so multiple landlords. Um, and you can email questions there um, and they should get back to you. I've heard mixed reviews though about how soon or how often they actually return those emails, but it is one form of communication that may work to try and assess what the um, the status is. And if you're a tenant and you've been denied, you don't agree with the denial, um, there is an appeals process uh, that you can go through. There's a, a form that you can submit um, basically explaining why you don't think that your application should be should have been denied and request the appeal um, that they reconsider the denial. An appeal is considered a pending application because it basically sends you from a denied um, status to back to a pending status while they are reviewing that um, appeal. So that is, is also something that if uh, as a tenant, you should notify your landlord if you're appealing a denial to let them know that because it may it may not reflect immediately on their dashboard that you've appealed the process. So it's good to communication. You know, we say this a lot. Communication is always critical to the, making sure that these things work properly with all with all parties involved. Rachel, can you throw back up the uh, coming attractions slide too? Yes. So once again, next week, we are doing a four hour CLE training. Actually, it's a bit difficult to get questions fit in during this session. I can tell you having done this many times over the years, we cram a lot into those four hours. Um, and so, uh, but hopefully it would be instructive for anybody watching. Next up, June 1, uh, I assume we're going to have a really big crowd for this uh, presentation. Rent control. Wow, you can't say two words much more um, ear catching than rent control in the landlord tenant world. Uh, both landlords and tenants are fascinated to hear about what's going on. We're going to be focusing on St. Paul uh, as they do have an enacted ordinance that now is in place. Uh, as of May 1, they are uh, you know, on the books enforcing that in St. Paul. Minneapolis, if you'll recall, also passed a uh, rent control ordinance, although it wasn't as, as firm about what was going to happen next. And there is a committee that has been, at least the participants have been, I think, named uh, to start sometime in the next couple of months. Uh, where Minneapolis will be talking about what they're considering. So we're not really going to be focusing on Minneapolis's rent control ordinance because it doesn't truly exist yet. It's very theoretical. St. Paul's is not, though. It is no longer theoretical. It is in place. It is complicated, to say the least. Uh, and uh, so learning how it works, how it's working, uh, at that point, they'll have a month under their belts. So they'll, they'll know a little bit more about uh, how, it's, how it's being processed and what the questions are. Um, and I assume that they'll be able to answer questions and I'm guessing we'll get a lot of them uh, for that session. So please tune in for uh, either or both of those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just saw at the end of the chat, uh, Maggie was asking about um, folks who aren't on the dashboard I would say calling 211 or that landlord's email address is the best way to start with that. Well, I think that uh, we've, we've been told that e either we've educated people so well that there's no possible questions left or yeah. they just, uh, like you say, want to get outside and who can blame them on a day like this. They have fled to the sunshine. Absolutely. Okay. I don't blame them. Thanks for hosting, Rachel. <laughs>
Absolutely. Thanks for all of your insights, Michael. Mike, it's been great. Have a wonderful rest of your day all. And thank you all for joining us. And hopefully we will see you on some of our future webinars. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to give, get in touch. Have a great rest of your day all. Goodbye.